Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back from your coffee break. I see the, the stragglers coming in. Okay, now it's time to hear from the people on the front line of the battle for the planet. And these are the people responding to the ecological threats to Earth. And I would like to introduce the moderator first of all, Mr. Joe Schweier, the head of climate change and disaster response. Great to have you here. And our panelists, we have three panelists for this session, Mr. Mikhail Dimovsky, Executive Director, Regional Environment Center for Central and Eastern Europe. Great to see you on stage. And Emily Boyd, Professor from Lund University Center for Sustainability Studies. Great to see you. And Martin Anderson, Senior Program Manager, DG Development Corporation from the European Commission. Great to have you all. Have a fantastic session. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maria. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to, to this session. Um, you know, I've been wondering since yesterday a little bit how I wanted to start this. And the previous panel has made it extremely easy for me. Uh, by showing the clip from Conservation International, uh, Mother Earth, that I hope everybody of you has seen. By the way, in case you were wondering who the narrator was, that was Julia Roberts. And you should actually go, uh, if you have some time, to the Conservation International website. There is a whole series of these clips uh, on, on water, on mountains, on forests, on soil. And a really stark reminder that indeed the planet does not need us, uh, but we do need the planet. And at current consumption rates, uh, I think the estimates, uh, Emily will correct me, she's more in that world than I am, but we celebrate, no, celebrating is not the right word, we mark every year the day where we have exceeded our annual budget in terms of natural resources. And currently that's in August, I think every year that, that occurs. And at current consumption rates, we uh, manage to, uh, we need three planets to actually sustain uh, the consumption we have. Now, some of us, myself included, are believers in space travel and eventually we colonize Mars and beyond. But it will probably take some time and so managing a planet instead of three is something that is really serious business. Now, having said that, to come a little bit more to this session, but, you know, I talk about planetary boundaries because the, the session is about planetary boundaries, resilience and risk-informed development. Um, and if you just look at the news also in preparation for, for this session, over the last few days, uh, the Secretary General has come out uh, in the last week saying climate change is the biggest threat to human, uh, to human security. Uh, the Fijian Prime Minister has just been quoted in the last 48 hours, there was not a cyclone in the Pacific, that the Pacific Islands are facing a fight for survival because of series of devastating cyclones that are becoming the norm. Uh, we're talking about the sixth extinction uh, in terms of biodiversity in the Anthropocene, uh, in terms of a geological time that is marked by the footprint, the imprint of, of mankind. Pandemics, inequality, vulnerability, you get the picture. And of course, this session is not about being depressed or about uh, a doomsday scenario, but actually very practically looking at resilience, looking at our planetary boundaries, looking at risk informed development, unpacking it, and looking at a way forward. Because as much as the threats are there, we actually do have the solutions in our toolkit to address these uh, particular issues and turn it simply around from threats to opportunities. We have a fantastic panel uh, to discuss some of these issues. Uh, we will be starting uh, with, with Emily from Lund University always give us a perspective more from the policy, academic research perspective, but very much a perspective that is able to look at, if you wish, the 30,000 foot picture in terms of global research and understanding and how that actually translates to your three feet above the ground practical work that needs to be done. Uh, we also have with us uh, Martin from, uh, from the uh, European Commission, from the Development Corporation, who gives us a particular look at also technological hazards in, 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 in Central Asia and uh, Mihail, who uh, works uh, in the Regional Environment Center in, in Hungary, 
uh, and is of course very well versed in the environmental issues in, in this region. Uh, we will, and I've asked the panelists to be extremely brief in their uh, initial opening uh, remarks uh, to give us a little bit of a time to interact. Obviously, since we're starting late, uh, lunch will not be at one o'clock, uh, but I promise not to further delay the proceedings uh, than they are already. So with that, I'd like to invite Emily to uh, give us her opening remarks. Thank you very much, Joe, and thank you everyone for the uh, invitation to be here today. So I have a quick five-minute intervention where I'm going to make three points. So firstly, um, I've been asked to speak a bit about resilience. And you can see here in this picture, uh, when we think about the SDGs, which is clearly the center of this conference here, the way that we can think about uh, linking the SDGs to resilience is in the way this pie chart depicts the, the basis for the way that we build um, societal resilience and resilient economies on the basis of the biosphere. So it's very important to consider how the biosphere features in the way that we are able to anticipate, absorb and adapt to external hazards and shocks uh, and changes that are brought about uh, by, for example, climate change or more broadly, global environmental changes. Where this matters and where this links to uh, practical applications and implementation is really when we start to see, for example, extreme events or the types of events that Joe just mentioned in Fiji, where we have trade-offs and synergies between the different SDGs. And how then do we bring together these SDGs in terms of the priorities of economic development, but also the potential trade-offs that we have with building climate capacity uh, adaptation capacity or resilience, together with also reducing inequalities and ensuring that there is inclusion or the kinds of institutions that build uh, societal uh, inclusion and capacity and cohesion. So we have to then really engage with conversations about trade-offs and we have to engage with understanding really the detail of what those might entail. And this will obviously vary from place to place. So in looking forward and thinking about linking the, the basics, the Earth system and its capacity to adapt in line with society, in line with the economy, there are three areas I think are worthwhile and important to consider. The first is how can we think about unlocking what I call undesirable resilience. So when we talk about resilience, we're often thinking about a positive resilience, a positive trend. Uh, harnessing capacity, harnessing energy, harnessing uh, the, the human uh, capacity to withstand change or to, to engage with it. But there are also important areas where we can talk about negative resilience, and those could include things like legacy, which we're going to hear a bit about from Martin. Those areas where we're locked into particular development pathways or where institutions can start to identify themselves where there might be lock-ins to unlock those towards a new trajectory. We need to think across disciplines. The SDGs offer a fantastic opportunity to work across sectors, uh, across north-south, uh, across new partnerships. And the third point is a really proactive looking for synergies, firstly by identifying trade-offs and then really engaging with where we can find those entry points uh, to working effectively and collectively towards priorities that matter in our regions or our nations or at local level. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for, that, for that, Emily. And let me actually uh, use the opportunity to give you a quick follow-up question. Since we, we are here to understand how, and you just give us a, a, a glimpse into that, how resilience is actually key to achieving the SDGs, so understanding risk and development, how they interact. And you talked about new partnerships. Can you just say something more about what do you mean by new partnerships? What kind of partnerships do we need to achieve uh, this resilience approach? So, um, so I come from uh, Lund University, so I'm in the university sector. And I think that science can offer some really important insights uh, and uh, knowledge. So partnerships between universities, 
uh, and governments, uh, universities and private sector. I think uh, local governments working together with um, non-governmental organizations, a whole, a whole variety of partnerships. And I think that in fact, to achieve resilience, you need multiple partnerships and many stakeholders working together. And I think one of the, uh, the important actors is the private sector. And I think we need to think more about how we bring the private sector on board. Okay, thank you. Um, also, actually, for mentioning the private sector so specifically, right, I'm, I'm reminded of, of also yesterday's session uh, with the private sector and the absolutely central role they have for all of us to be able to achieve the SDGs, not just from a financing perspective, but actually as drivers of development. Uh, and so let's see whether we have some time to come back to that. There might, there might be a question in the audience on a resilience approach that will really bring the private sector more in board. Um, but let's uh, go, uh, actually, um, I will come to you last, Martin. I will jump, I will, I will jump to, the, to the other end uh, to give us a broader glimpse at the region. And at the end, we're going to Central Asia. But uh, Mihail, if you could, uh, from your perspective, and as the head of the uh, Regional Environment Center in Budapest with a focus on Central and Eastern Asia, uh, sorry, yes. Europe, Thank you, uh, Chairman. Yeah. Yes, I'm coming from the Regional Environmental Center, which is uh, located uh, with a headquarters in Budapest. It's our hub, and we have uh, country offices, missions in all the countries in uh, Eastern Europe, Central Europe, but also we operate in the Middle East, North Africa, but also to some extent in the Caribbean. So we are an international organization based on the, on the, on the treaty. Uh, what, first of all, I would like to in, say one impression from, uh, from the conference that uh, uh, congratulating UNDP for organizing the dialogue. Uh, this is one of the few conferences when uh, I have a feeling that we moved from the goals towards the nation plans. Uh, quite well focused and quite well uh, elaborated with number of uh, proposed actions. We came now to the resilience and to the risk reduction. It's one I consider one of the most important uh, issues to be discussed. It's not a goal of itself, not yet, but it's a cross-cutting issue that is really uh, impacting the implementation of number of uh, number of the SDGs. We have seen uh, the interventions from the private sector. Uh, the private sector will be impacted. Uh, the private sector competitiveness the private sector organization and also uh, branding, but also the private sector will be impacted with costs. So when we are talking about the resilience and also the risk reduction, one of the goals which is uh, particularly uh, dealing with the, with the resilience and uh, risk reduction is the, is the private sector, the industries. We at the REC, we do both research and also implementing actions in order to bring together the private sector, but also the decision makers, the governments, on uh, regulating the field, but also finding ways how to be more resilient, but also how to mitigate, to mitigate different uh, risks uh, uh, and different, uh, different uh, impacts on the, on the communities, let's say. The, the uh, madam from the insurance company, the CEO, uh, had a very nice, very nice uh, uh, statement. The insurance companies will be heavily impacted because they will have to bear the risks and also they have to bear the costs. Not talking about the environmental liability rules, but uh, we need to be ready for, 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 for those actions. The CEO from the uh, Unilever, uh, their competitiveness will be heavily impacted and they will need to comply with the rules but also they will need to develop uh, new uh, products. When talking about the resilience, the major focus was given to the climate change. Uh, uh, a lot of emphasis on the mitigation and also on the adaptation, but however, uh, it was quite important to hear uh, the the, the uh, remarks from my colleague to understand what is really a resilience and uh, what is really a risk reduction. 
You know, by 2030, the 80 percent of the European population will be living in the cities, and uh, they will be certainly affected with a number of risks coming from the from the climate change, but also they need to uh, learn on how to mitigate uh, those risks. We are exposed to accidents, we are exposed to risks. Uh, I believe that the uh, risk reduction and also the resilience should be quite well embedded in all the goals and all the SDGs and certain actions to be taken both by the decision makers, the policy makers, but also uh, by the regulated uh, community. The, uh, we will hear more and more on uh, resilience. We are only three speakers now, but it doesn't mean that uh, the subject is not, uh, not that important. But I would like to see also from the audience, how do you understand resilience? How do you, how do you understand the, the risk? And how do you see uh, the, the, uh, those elements uh, taken on board while achieving the, the SDGs. Maybe in the future there will be another goal, but we will see how it goes. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, for that, Mihail, and, and also actually the invitation to the audience to help us break this down further. Let me also allow me, Martin, to a quick follow-up question to Mihail. You mentioned the insurance sector. Uh, and another thing I was just reading this morning, I was looking ahead uh, in, in, to this session, is that uh, in the US, uh, the cost of the disasters last year, the droughts, the wildfires, the floods, uh, and of course the hurricanes that we've seen, they cost in 2017 exceeded the cumulative cost from uh, 1980 to 2010. So the impact of disaster in the US in the 30 years from 2000 and, sorry, 1980 to 2010 was less than the cost last year. Now part of that is climate change, part of that is of course also increased exposure. Take the case of the, the cyclone in Houston, uh, people over the last 20 years built massively in wetlands and if you do build in wetlands you will get flooded. Of course we continue to build in wetlands but that's maybe another discussion. But to come back to insurance companies, obviously for some of this they will no longer offer for instance flood insurance. How can we make insurance a better partner to help us drive also the economic decision making, the planning decision making to avoid these in the future. Do you have a perspective on that? You know, um, we are operating uh, in uh, Europe and in the countries who are uh, acceding to the European Union. And uh, you know, in the, in the European Union, one of the most uh, complex piece of legislation is the Environmental Liability Directive. I wouldn't say a controversial, it's extremely uh, well-developed and very complex uh, piece of EU law which is regulating uh, recovery of the costs from, uh, from disasters but also from, uh, from accidents. You know the insurance companies they, they will certainly need to align uh, towards uh, incoming uh, liabilities but also a new type of legal framework would need to be developed in order to streamline the, those who are providing the insurance uh, with, uh, with those who are expected to be uh, insured. Of course, there is a risk. Uh, you are talking about the risk reduction. Uh, the risk has to be assessed. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, uh, on the top of all the scenarios, modeling, predictions, measures. We need to know what is coming, how to mitigate, uh, what would be the costs, and then enter into some sort of a sharing responsibilities. The, you know, our headquarters is in Hungary, in a nice city called St. Andrea. We have a big campus, and uh, we had a conference center which was uh, once upon a time the biggest solar power plant in Hungary. But we are flooded, heavily flooded, from Danube, and uh, up to now, uh, the insurance companies were not so willing to step in and insure the area. 
the uh, the risks, uh, the impacts of the of the of the disasters uh, would not be only on the insurance companies, but also on the whole regulated community. Uh, flood protection, the uh, water management, uh, industrial risks will have an impact on uh, on their competitiveness, for sure. The the big companies who are really heavily operating on the market will need to comply with uh, increasing and more stringent rules. But we had a study when we analyzed that those rules will certainly not impact their competitiveness, but would uh, even strengthen their competitiveness by delivering much better products. The uh, resilience and the risk reduction is a quite complex matter. Uh, Universities are working a lot, the academia is working a lot, decision makers are working a lot, and also the, the international organizations are trying somehow to uh, implement actions and work together with the governments and all the stakeholders to uh, find a solution, but also to uh, put the way forward. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, I'm certainly something to think about how we can get the insurance sector more as, a, as an active partner up front and not a last resort once the damage has happened and hopefully we get, we get a payout. Um, Martin, um, an interesting career in DEFCO, having worked in Africa and other places, but now in charge of issues related to nuclear safety and, uh, now let me get this right again, environmental remediation. See, I've been learning since yesterday, since we spoke. Uh, a specific focus on Central Asia, dealing with another kind of hazards, technological hazards. Uh, look forward to your, your remarks. Please. Yeah. Uh, I will take the podium here, so it's a little bit more dynamic. I would like to take you to the engine room or the kitchen, as it was described yesterday. I like that uh, expression, the kitchen. Uh, and just give you some uh, con very concrete examples of how we are trying to do our humble uh, contribution to reach the sustainable development goals and uh, give a description of these technological disasters we are facing in Central Asia, uh, with, where we are working with resilient uh, risk information to the local population. So I don't know how many of you have been to Central Asia, but I, I sure not so many of you have been to places like, like uh, these pictures are showing. This is Mailusu, it's a city of 15,000 inhabitants. It was one of the places where the Soviet Union was mining uh, uranium ore for the whole uh, uranium uh, industry uh, back in the 50s and 60s. Um, extremely poor region, uh, marginalized, you can see people are digging into uh, tailing sites that contain radioactive and toxic waste in order to dig up some scrap metal in order to, to earn a little bit of money for the income. This place here has 23 toxic tailing sites scattered all over the place. People are living in the middle of it. And this is just one out of many sites in Central Asia where they're facing similar problems. Can I please have the second uh, picture, please? Second picture. Thank you. This is from another site in uh, Tajikistan. Uh, the person there standing there with a the Geiger counter, this is a, a whole valley called Digmai. We are talking about more than 30 million tons of toxic waste, just a couple of kilometers from Sudaria, that is feeding into the uh, Fergana Valley, the breadbaskets of Central Asia. Our models have shown that in, in an event where this, due to climate change or because they are maybe start operating this site again, they start flooding this whole valley with, with, with chemicals and wet uh, contents and you have a, a natural disaster like an earthquake, the whole thing will collapse and then they will drift down, downhill into the, into the uh, river system where not only the local environment but also the whole regional environment is affected with with whatever causes of instability and so on in this rather fragile region. 
Uh, another picture you see is uh, children in the summer. They're drinking, uh, collecting water, because in some of these places, water is really a scare commodity, or a scare resource in the, in the summer. So they are collecting water, using it for irrigation and, and for watering cattle and so on. And some of this water, we are talking 50 times above the safety limits what the WHO are setting for drinking standards. Could you then s switch to the last uh, with the map, please? Uh, could you, there is a, a map, yes, thank you. Um, so what are we doing? Um, this is not something the Central Asian countries have inherited themselves. It was something they, it was not something they have produced themselves. They can't be blamed. It was something they inherited with their independence here back uh, 27, 28 years ago. So what we're doing now with, with partners, especially with the UNDP, that we are focusing on the seven high priority legacy sites in Central Asia. And for these sites, east of those you just saw on, in, in, in Kyrgyzstan and in Tajikistan, there's also two in Uzbekistan. There we are doing, first we're doing a, a very precise site characterization, basically saying, what are the dangers? Where is it radioactive? How are people living? Are they using the water? You take all this together, then you start developing risk models in these projects. You, you, you develop and say, okay, the risks are, are, are so and so and so for these, these specific objects on each of these sites. And then on that basis, you are starting then to develop remediation plans. How do you basically remove this danger? How do you, if you have a tailing site next to a river, it's not a very good thing. As we've seen in the videos and so on, mother nature is very unpredictable. It's just a matter of time where you have an extreme flash flood and it's going to wash down this toxic tailing material down the river, down into a neighboring country, or contaminating the, the people who are using the water further downstream. So we have actually done a lot of good work the last couple of years. It's taken a long time, but now for the first time, we got, for these seven high priority sites, we, got, we know what to do, we know how to do it, and even more importantly, we know how much it will cost. So how much do you think it will cost to remediate these seven sites here? I discussed it with some colleagues yesterday in the coffee break, and they were a little bit astonished that we are not talking about more funds. It's going to cost 85 million euros. For 85 million euros, we can basically once and for all remediate these legacy sites where the Central Asian states are really begging the international community to, to, to help them. From the EU side, we have provided the first seeding capital of 15 million. Now we are, together with partners and so on, looking for additional funding of the 70 million. Uh, and this is the year of action 2018. All this is now moving, but simultaneously, simultaneously with these projects, we have been working extremely closely with the UNDP in order to engage the local population, because they, of course, need to know what are the dangers, what are, what are we foreseeing as solutions, getting them involved. And it was quite interesting to hear yesterday about, from the professor in Michigan, how she presented the Chinese model with top down. Uh, what we are doing with, with UNDP is, for instance, we did a survey with the local population, asking the local population, how do you see the local risks in your community? What are the risks with these, with these tailing sites? So it was a completely different approach. It was, it was bottom up. And this risk perception we used in the modeling of the, of the risk of these uh, environmental plans. So they're already embedded into the plans. We have also set up information centers with, together with UNDP and the NSEC initiative so people can go to a place and get informed, AHU centers. And we have also, together with UN uh, uh, Environment, uh, created capacity building activities so we basically uh, are providing and uh, improving the capacity for the local government, the regional governments, to be part of these remediation uh, activities. So they know what are the roles, for instance, in the environmental impact assessment, because they have a role there. I'm, fi I'm finalizing now my, my introduction here. Uh, we are now, together with UNDP, also looking to extend this stakeholder engagement project, because we have made some very good results and we want to build on that. Because the, the remediation, as I explained, we have the plans now. We, need, we, need, uh, we know what to do for, for these seven sites. We just need now the 70 million, then we can do it. But you have the whole implementation that we are talking maybe 10 years for some of these sites. 
And, and there it's important that the population are empowered, that they know what are the risks. Because some of these sites, you might need 1,000 trucks to move day and night in order to remove some of these tailing sites that are next to the rivers. And you also have something we call stewardship, also the long term. When you design this kind of solutions, you're not just designing them for the next 20 years. You're designing them for, for centuries. The design criteria in best international practice, what we're doing, is for, for minimum 200 years. So of course, it, it gets, you need a whole completely different mindset. You need to teach the local population that these sites have in the past contained toxic material. They are now covered, but they need to be monitored closely. And it's much better that the local population is aware of that than you have this, some, some nice monitoring activities filed in a central archive in, in the capital that will be forgotten after a couple of years or 10 years and so on. So that's why we are now working very closely with the UNDP in order to embed also these activities into this new follow-up uh, uh, project for, with, the, with the stakeholder engagement in Central Asia. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot uh, for that, Martin, and uh, a really interesting example how our, say, human activity or industrial activity creates new risks, and that, of course, can interplay with natural hazards. You mentioned flash floods, earthquakes. Uh, in this particular case, these, these tailings from uranium mining, or if you look around the world, we can think of all sorts of toxic deposits in industrial areas. Um, we all remember the triple disaster in, uh, in Japan in March 2011, where an earthquake and a tsunami and then the nuclear power plant shutting down. So this is another aspect of, of resilience that we have to keep in mind and where we're creating problems for ourselves because we don't think ahead. But what I'm really curious about, to come back briefly on your, on your intervention here as well, is what you said at the end about stewardship and the local, uh, the local community. Can you just go a little bit more for, for a minute or two into detail, what, what do we talk about involving these communities? What have we learned and what do we actually ask them to do for this uh, particular stewardship that's, that's required? It is something that we are, going, we are designing right now, but we can see from other, other places where, uh, because remediation has been done in other parts of the world, and it's, it's very cultural based. You need to tap into what are the, what are the local uh, habits, what are the, the way information is, is handed from one place to, uh, from one generation to another. Uh, in some societies, you might have a very strong uh, government structures where you can rely on that. But in other places, you, there you'll have to make sure that the local population uh, are taking these risks into consideration also for the future. In some places, uh, you see that uh, it sounds a little bit strange, but there you actually see that it's carved into stones, that here is a legacy site that contains toxic, dangerous material, because it's not, it's not written on a sign or paper, because that will disappear after a number of years. The stone, at least, will stay there for yeah, maybe 100 years or even longer, hopefully. So it is something that uh, is, there's not one solution fits all here. That is something that we need to design uh, based on the local, uh, local conditions and traditions and cultures. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you all three of you for really being so specific and to the point. I truly appreciate that. We have uh, a good amount of time left to actually take, uh, take questions. Uh, and um, before I open up, to, and also have some questions actually coming on Twitter, I'll come to those in, in, in a minute. Um, so where we've come as a development community, if you wish, is really understanding that from a development framework that was rather sectoral and sort of looked at development in the purity of development only, if you think about the MDGs, they were truly risk blind. We didn't talk about resilience and risk and crisis as much in those days. Whereas nowadays in the SDG framework, it's quite well embedded, and we've just heard three examples, uh, starting with Emily, how actually resilience approaches and risk-informed development are key to achieve the SDGs. So while we have that overall understanding, bringing it to the ground and actually doing it requires a partnership approach, as we've heard, the private sector came out strongly, uh, et cetera. So I'm interested to take a few rounds now of, of questions from, from the floor. I'll take three. Please introduce yourself. Please be brief. 
uh, and uh, direct the question to the specific speaker if it is directed to a specific speaker uh, as well. And let me start with the gentleman on the left here. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Timur Abdullayev, also known as Timur Headache Abdullayev and Timur, Timur Troublemaker Abdullayev. My question is to Martin. I come from Uzbekistan and uh, it was not so exciting in a good way to see the map because that's where I live. That's where, where my family lives. So my question is very selfish. I mean, um, you were saying that um, you're working on getting extra funding, but my understanding is that you were speaking about external funding. What about domestic funding? Um, I, I come from public health area, and I have seen countries actually taking over from international financing institutions part of the burden, and it's increasing. So I think it would be logical to see the same in, in environment. So, and $75 million, I mean, for me, that's hell of a money. But for the country, it's not. I just checked the numbers of the GDP. Of course, it's not absolutely correct, but still, 75 million is like peanuts. And um, I, would, I would just wonder, um, looking at, uh, at that perspective, and also uh, there have been news that um, Uzbek government and the Russian um, Rosatom Corporation, which is the nucle nuclear plant building corporation, they have plans to build a, a nuclear plant in, in Uzbekistan, the first ever. If that happens, that doesn't make me happy personally, but um, it's a controversial issue, there is a lot of debate. But if that happens, that means that the uranium production will probably go up. And if now we're just exporting uranium, uh, then we will start using it, and of course, inevitably, we will also have an increase in toxic waste. And according to Russian legislation, no matter what Rosatom is saying, according to Russian legislation, they cannot bring toxic waste from abroad, which means we will have to deal with it. So it would be also good to, to hear your perspective on that, because this is uh, what we have now, but we may have more. So is there a sustainable solution? Thank you and sorry for the long question. Thank you very much for that. Um, do I have another question from the floor at this time? It's the lights, I don't really see anything. No, I do not see any hand up. So Martin, I give you a, a minute to, you ready? Are you ready, okay. I can, I can do it in a minute to Timo Troublemaker. <laughs> um, no, the first question, thank you very much for posing that uh, regarding domestic funding. I'm very pleased to say that uh, Uzbekistan is one of the few countries, except from Kazakhstan, who is in a different economic, uh, let's say, st uh, status uh, compared to Tajikistan and uh, the Kyrgyz Republic, that have actually remediated something uh, nationally and using the state funds. I have also to say, unfortunately, that the, the quality of, of this remediation um, could have been better. Uh, because you, there's a lot of know-how that needs to be going into the design. It's not just pouring dirt on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a waste site. You need to understand how you do it, the slopes, the climate, uh, how you do different layers. And what we right now see in, in, in uh, it's a place called uh, you know, Shakaftar, doesn't matter, in, in Uzbekistan. That is right now, you already see here a couple of years later, erosion uh, gullies inside the tailing. So now, you know, contamination is just spreading. So um, that is a little bit the situation. Uh, we, of course, assisting our partners in Uzbekistan with, with the European expertise because we have a lot to offer there. Um, we would love that the other Central Asian state could chip in with, uh, with, uh, with more funding, of course. It is, uh, I have to say it's a very difficult sale right now, uh, asking for 70 million. Uh, the world has a lot of challenges, as we all know, but it's also even more difficult difficulty when the, the Central Asian States uh, are maybe seeing the international partners as now, you know, we are taking care of it. We can't, we are partners, huh? we can help, we can support, we can, and so on, but we can't do it alone. Uh, and that is a message which we, are, we are coming with again and again to, when we have dialogues with, uh, with the Central Asian States. To come to your very brief on, on a new NPP, I don't really have any knowledge about that. I know that uh, there is uh, some, some see nuclear, new, new power plants as a way to, to combat global warming. I have to stress that 
I'm coming from a unit with also called nuclear uh, safety. We are not promote, promoting nuclear energy. We are promoting nuclear safety. We don't want to see things like what happened in, in Fukushima again or in Chernobyl. We want to prevent it. Uh, so that is all our focus. Uh, we are not uh, supporting operators and so on. So I don't really have any comments uh, to that. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Emily, let's, let's come to you. I have, I'm going to combine a couple of questions that came in uh, on Twitter. Let's see if I can make sense of that. Um, we, we talked about risk and, you know, risk informed development resilience. And it, as I mentioned, as you actually mentioned as well, it's being more embedded in our discourse. We understand the benefits from it. But breaking it down practically is sometimes complicated. Uh, and actually having at the country level the right tools or institutions is not always the case. Uh, recognizing the importance of functioning institutions, um, where do you see opportunities uh, to perhaps um, improve or change the institutional environment to govern differently, to have uh, the ability to do this risk-informed development approach? And would you know about perhaps some examples of transformative policies that some countries have put in place that we could learn from? I do realize I put you on the spot, but I'm sure you have a good yeah, answer. Yeah, I'll, I'll think of something. Um, yeah, so really important questions. And um, firstly, I think you start off with the, the matter of the difficulties in translating resilience from uh, academic discourse and, and debate into actual practical uh, actions. And uh, I've been following this debate for the last 10, 15 years, and it's, it's uh, interesting to see that the concept of resilience has been taken up pretty much everywhere now. You can see it across institutions. The World Bank has taken it up, UNDP and so on. Governments have taken it up. I think it's often um, taken up and interpreted in ways that either maybe fit with existing uh, organizational structures or interests and objectives. Uh, for example, in the United States, I was visiting there in October and uh, currently, it's not so popular to talk about climate change, but one can talk about resilience, but if we translate that, it's about resilience of coastal erosion or, you know, building up um, seawalls or whatever it might be to, to adapt to hazards, but it's not resilience necessarily in the context of climate change. So, so we can see oh, it's also been used in ways to depict the kind of responses that we see on the ground and sometimes in a, in a positive way, but also we saw in New Orleans, for example, that people said after uh, the struggles they, they faced, don't call us resilient, we're not resilient. Because in a way, it also takes away responsibilities and the social contract that the state has with people. You know, it can displace that and, and force the responsibility onto individuals to take action. So going back to your earlier question about the partnerships, I think the partnerships between, uh, between private sector, government, but also civil society and citizens, the public, is really, really essential here. So you're gonna have a, a bricolage of partnerships depending on the context and depending on your objectives and what you want to reach with your resilience, I would say. Uh, I, would, I think that, for example, in Bangladesh, they have developed their climate adaptation and the resilience strategies in quite an interesting way. I think that here the issue of leadership is really important. And I'd like us to start talking about leadership in the context of resilience and partnerships. Because if we look at how Bangladesh has been successful in creating a sort of national mechanism for dealing with what we call loss and damage or extreme events, it's a constellation of individual actors uh, that are very prominent on the international scene, uh, networks of people within the country, and scientists and local groups and so on. So it's a sort of network leadership and partnership that's come together there uh, with the most current science as well, because you need the science to be anticipatory. You know, it's not a crystal ball, but you need to have that monitoring and feedback to give you the best possible information to then make decisions on. So, uh, I don't know if that answers. It's going towards the question of resilience, how we translate into practice. 
Uh, there's a range of toolboxes out there. I know that the, Re the Resilience Alliance and the Stockholm Resilience Center are currently working on a toolbox for resilience assessment, which I think is uh, a step in the right direction. It's really under their grade project, which is engaging with the interface between the develop and resilience. They're developing these tools. So trying to move away from just the science uh, and the development, but filling that gap. So that's the start in that direction. And then I think Bangladesh, but many, many of the Philippines are also developing really interesting mechanisms for dealing uh, with resilience and extremes. So, um, and then I have a question for my colleagues if I, so just on this issue about um, sort of the processes that you see that are ongoing within the contacts uh, here in terms of um, dealing with legacy in uranium and also dealing with flood risk in Europe. Um, I wondered whether um, you have considered or thought about this issue of social contract and the, the, the changes that need to occur or are occurring in terms of reconfiguring those social contracts that exist um, in order to build resilience and what the role of sort of conciliation or reconciliation uh, plays in that. So for example, the example here about the uranium, I was wondering as you spoke, you know, the processes that you go through, do people link back to the past in the way they understand how they need to engage going forward? Uh, do you build in ways in which people can understand that their role and their responsibilities and ensuring that there is local resilience, for example. Or if we think about flood risk in Europe, you know, reconfiguring social contracts between government and individuals or government and private sector. I just wondered if you could both comment on that. Yeah, uh, yeah that would be one of the, one of the options. Uh, regarding the remediation of sites, uh, you know, there were a number of examples when the number of sites uh, also in the Central Asia have been... Uh, privatized or were under privatization. And then the question was the, who would, uh, what are the costs for the remediation and who would, uh, who would pay it? Um, that was uh, also an issue in the, in the uh, Central and Eastern Europe. You know, from that time, there were a number of sites which were heavily contaminated, uh, which were and still are posing uh, a number of uh, risks. And there were certain models which were applied to a number of states. Uh, for example, the some of the costs for the remediation were embedded into the price of the enterprise, and then the enterprise was sold uh, with those costs. Of course, there were a number of cases when the, uh, the costs for the remediation were put on the burden of the uh, enterprise who is uh, purchasing the, uh, the sites. But um, regrettably, uh, there was no uh, unique model and some of those models, they failed to uh, produce uh, uh, results. Uh, regarding the uh, flood prevention, the, in the pre-accession countries and also in the European Union, the, uh, the models or the, the actions part of the EU legislation, the Water Framework Directive, are strictly followed. But the, uh, that those pieces of legislation not regulating uh, uh, quite uh, in details the, uh, the social contracts. And uh, uh, I'm not quite uh, informed that the social contracts, they have been heavily uh, implemented. But I certainly believe that this might be one, uh, one uh, way to go. Um, the other uh, kind of uh, important issue is that the uh, risks are there and also disasters are happening. Uh, there are a number of studies which are trying to locate the, uh, not only the, uh, the liability in terms of economic costs, but also the criminal liabilities. And then it's quite different, difficult to uh, understand or to locate uh, the guilt in those, uh, in those uh, cases. 
of course, we're entering in an entirely different, different uh, area. You know, with the, what I can see that the, the risk reduction and the resilience, it's uh, getting quite high on the agendas, uh, quite high on the agendas of the decision makers and the government, but also quite high on the agenda of the universities and also on the international organizations. Uh, that means that the resilience and risk reduction is uh, it's uh, going to be considered as a horizontal element in the SDGs. Uh, but what it's important to see how we have uh, an actions and approach which can be shared among the number of countries. And therefore, the universities here are playing a quite essential role and also the modeling. Uh, we have seen in, uh, in Central Asia, yes, that's, that's true. Uh, we have seen a question from, uh, from Timur, the troublemaker, on the, <laughs> on the budgets. Uh, in a uh, in number of cases, the costs uh, will be, uh, like in Uzbekistan, either taken by the central budget or will be uh, supported by the international IFIs. But what is really important is how the job will be done and the quality of, and the quality of work. Uh, this is very, very important, particularly in the nuclear, in the nuclear uh, sites. Um, yeah, I don't know whether I managed to respond to your question. <laughs> okay. Martin? I'll respond very briefly. Um, yes, social contracts is uh, very important, and uh, we are trying. I think our challenge in, in Central Asia, the places we're working, is that we're, not, we're talking about uh, communities that are extremely, the poverty is, is really there. So whenever uh, you, you install some, let's say, some measuring equipment and so on, and you explain the, the, why, you, why it's needed and why it needs to be in place for a number of months, quite often it's, it's disappearing, it's vandalized, it's stolen because the shepherds are, uh, are looking for to, you know, something that can guard the sheep uh, sheeps and so on. And um, so that's why we're really hoping here to work with the UNDP in order to make some social contract because it's, they, they have their roles and responsibilities. Huh? Uh, and just very quickly, uh, contaminated water, we know how to clean this water, but there's a cost with that. We can provide a initial installation and maybe the consumables, you know, to clean the water for the first year. But after that, there will be cost. We are talking maybe some very small cost, let's say a couple of euro cents per cubic meter of, what, uh, of, of clean water. But if you've always been grown up, that water is free. It's been given freely, you know. It's, 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 you have to change the mindset. So that, that's what we are working on, and I'm sure we will uh, succeed in that. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I had to uh, just c quickly consult. We have about um, 10 minutes left before the hour is up that was allocated to, the, uh, to this panel, um, just comparing the questions also coming in over Twitter. Let me see if I have one or two more in the room before I come to the other Twitter questions, and then we wrap it up. So I have uh, on my left here um, the gentleman with the beard, and then behind you there was a finger lady. Yeah. Uh, so, ladies first, is that what you're saying? Okay, ladies first. Thank you. I'm Nicoletta Brazzola, and I'm an intern here at UNDP in climate change and disaster risk reduction. And I have a question, I'm coming from a scientific background, and uh, when talking about climate change in science, we always talk also about variability. Um, so my, my question is about um, climate re resilience. So we know that um, climate change uh, scenarios depend like climate change um, predictions actually depends heavily on a series of factors on economic uh, population growth and uh, um, social um, variabilities how do we address this complexity when we are um, when we are investing in climate adaptation uh, measures so how can we uh, uh, try to uh, to avoid um, negative investments thank you Gennady uh, Rashupkin, Eurasian Coalition on Mental Health. Uh, I'm also uh, from the area of uh, uh, public health 
and uh, uh, to use international support for uh, making changes in policies and systems is a, a huge discussion in, in public health. So, uh, does your uh, case uh, with the uh, nuclear plants uh, uh, somehow influences to the national policies and budgetary uh, systems and policies uh, to prevent in future such problems. So, uh, or you just gave uh, uh, money to countries and some problems some uh, were solved, uh, but there were no, there will be no. Uh, guarantees that uh, next case uh, the country uh, will again apply for some international support because systems are the same, uh, the same and, and uh, the budget uh, uh, directed to as, as old style, uh, Soviet style system. Okay, thank you for, for those two questions. Let me add a little bit more to the questions and you can uh, perhaps combine some of some of your answers, um, and and while you think about those two, I mean, uh, sort of related a little bit to the uh, how do we address the complexity and and uh, negative investments? Uh, to come back to the issue of transformative policies, when we talk about risk-informed development, and what do we actually need to do differently in terms of institutional uh, environment at the county level? You can't really have risk-informed development or avoid negative investment, mm -hmm. you know, building in wetlands and in a way that you get flooded, right? Um, if you don't know the risk. So we do need to invest in actually, first of all, understanding what are the risk drivers. In terms of natural hazards, risk assessments, of course, are very easy. Other risk factors, since resilience is not just about climate and disaster resilience, are more complicated. Um, but a lot of this is also about investment and cost. And we heard a lot about the cost of responding. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit also in terms of the context of, of institutions and cost on the opportunity to invest and actually isn't it cheaper to invest up front? Uh, what have we learned on that? So that's something to unpack a bit, I believe. Uh, and, and there's some feedback on Twitter that's coming in around that particular bucket of issues. Another question that came in is uh, someone notes that um, uh, climate change, a quote, is the mother of all, you know, challenges to development. Personally, I would, I think, agree with that when we see what happens around the world and that affects everything. Uh, and one question then is, do we actually have any nations that have made a, a successful transition from oil to fossil fuel economies or energy production? Now, I, I, the short answer is I personally don't know any nation that has managed it, uh, but the transition is well and fast underway. Uh, and quite a few countries have made very bold statements now uh, and plans in terms of going all the way uh, to 100% renewable energy uh, production. The question, of course, is this fast enough? Uh, and, and here, in terms of fossil fuel, um, what we need to remember, again, negative investments, we are subsidizing fossil fuel industry to the tunes of hundreds of billions of dollars per year. And this is mostly not as poverty measures in terms of actually allowing uh, poor families to access, you know, kerosene for lighting or cooking gas for cooking, but actually that goes to subsidies that are no longer justifiable. So that's something to keep in mind and I'd love a reaction from you if you have, you have one. And then, uh, Mihail, last but not least on Twitter, it's a little bit more directed to you, um, but all three of you in your, in your response, feel free to pick on up on any of these and respond to each other. But a question that came in here was, looking at the key environmental issues for the region uh, and related here about the fact that we often environmental issues talk uh, in a silo as well. It's been a little bit tough at times to get the key decision makers, finance ministries or others to actually pay attention to the environmental cost and build that thinking in uh, this resilience approach. So what can we do looking at these key challenges for the region, so specifically for the region, to do better? So this is summing up a little bit what came on uh, online. Uh, I know this is quite broad, so we can't respond to everything here. We have a lunch break coming up. I invite everybody to please continue speaking to the speakers. Uh, but uh, Emily, let's start with you uh, in, in, to respond to at least some of this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. OK, so I'll, I'll respond mostly to the question about climate change adaptation 
And I would um, urge you to think about um, what is it you're trying to solve. You know, this is about complexity and complex challenges. So the first, the first is what kind of question, what do you want to achieve? Uh, if you are disaggregating adaptation from development, or if you are trying to just provide technologies to solve the problem, you're going to run up against some challenges quite quickly. So it's reformulating the way we think about these issues as complex issues. Let's use the SDGs to do that. It's a fantastic framework for us to be able to think about the trade-offs between different dimensions that we want to achieve. What is it we want to achieve? Think of who you need to solve that problem. You know, who are the people who have the best knowledge and the best capacity and skills and resources to engage with that? Be it, uh, you know, people within your organization, people, uh, experts uh, that are working on these issues. Hook up with new people that you can identify. Um, and then consult, work locally, and work with the knowledge that exists locally to get that feedback on, are we talking about uh, climate variability here, are we talking about something different or unusual? And the knowledge and memories and the context or place within which you're working. And building in feedback mechanisms so that whatever we're doing within the SDGs is not perfect. We are learning as we're going along and feeding that back and improving is part of complex thinking. Yeah, and adapting in the actions that we're taking. Oh, I'll leave it at that for Time's sake. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, we, we have uh, one and a half minute each to two minutes each for you. Martin. Briefly, public, uh, public health, uh, the nuclear plants or nuclear uh, threats and so on. What we're doing right now uh, is we're building the capacity. We're building the capacity of the national uh, bodies, in, 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 especially in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Uh, because when you look at it from, from, from above, there's not, if you can, if you can tackle nationally the, 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 the threats coming from a legacy side that has a nuclear origin, it is the same as the threat coming from a chemical uh, uh, waste side. And there's many sites like that also in Central Asia, all over um, the regions we're working in. And if you can build the local capacity, you know, the different ministries, so uh, legislation, the whole legal framework. Then when you have done these uh, nuclear legacy sites, they are also much better uh, dressed in order to tackle the other uh, legacy issues that are, that are out there, we know it. Uh, regarding, the, there was a question, invest, investing upfront. Yes, it's, uh, we are promoting that. A way we are doing that is, for instance, in Tanzania. In Tanzania is start embarking on uranium production. There's a global demand on uranium. So right now, we are teaming up with the Tanzanian and African Union in, in strengthening their, their regional uh, and uh, uh, regulatory capacity. So you have a strong regulator in place when the, when the, when the international mining companies are moving in extracting uranium, so they don't just leave a mess afterwards, that you, from the start of the investment, are making sure that the solution, the long-term remediation is also in place. That's very, very important. And of course, we sometimes use in, in these dialogues the experience we have in Central Asia in this regard. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Miel? According to the question to the lady, the climate change strategies, of course, there are scenarios uh, with measures, without measures, with additional measures which are really much uh, determined, uh, or the viability is determined based on the input indicators. But however, all the climate change strategies, they are supposed to have a vulnerability assessment, which are, is really uh, assessing the potential risks. The, regarding the costs, um, there are two types of costs uh, to achieve certain measures, uh, actions. The, there are actions coming from the treaties and the bindings, and the countries there are some of the countries are negotiating when and until when they will be able to achieve those targets. There are two types of costs, administrative to set up the, the public administration, but also the costs that will be shared between the public and private sector. In a number of cases, uh, those costs are not very small, and therefore the IFIs are heavily involved in providing lending because those costs can certainly not be uh, covered by the budget. 
again coming back to the yes the, to the speakers from the HSB bank. Uh, I was expecting that they will pro give an information on some products because there are products which are investments into the sustainable development uh, uh, goals. The those investments into the SDGs uh, related uh, actions in the innovation, in the uh, achieving the uh, better technologies and so on are going up, which means that the, currently uh, we are facing a cycle when uh, the innovation and technology are investing a lot in order to meet the more stringent standards. Uh, for example, Euro 6, Euro 5 engines, uh, reduction of CO2 emissions, obligations coming from the energy community, treaty, and so on. So all those investments are uh, to be supported by the banks, but also the banks should be offering products which are related to uh, investments, uh, enabling the citizens to invest in those products. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will... Well, first of all, a round of applause for, for, the, uh, for the speakers. Uh, and, and secondly, I, I need to apologize to you. I had promised not to uh, you know, increase the delay in the day, but I've been now six minutes over, over time uh, and standing in the way between you and lunch. Uh, so I will not uh, in any way attempt to, to summarize this discussion, but just a couple of very quick takeaways when we, when we talk about risk reduction and resilience. We're actually not talking about two entirely separate things. And it's one takeaway is that the SDGs, I think you want to stress that, provide this really important analytical framework for us to embed a risk understanding in the development actions we take, in the investment decisions we make. And if we look at that at national and local level, we can actually uh, achieve much more already today than perhaps we have done in the past and avoid these negative investments that were mentioned earlier. Uh, last takeaway, we really need to, I want to stress, we talked about insurance, uh, we talked about investment cost, private sector. If we consider that so much of these investments have to come from the private sector, we need to find a better way to get them involved up front. So with that, I conclude. Uh, Maria, sorry we went a little bit no over time. No problem. But thank you, everyone. Thank you. And I can hear the hungry stomachs. And I invite you all to continue this fantastic conversation over lunch. Do keep tweeting. Thank you for all the questions from the audience and see you in an hour's time. Thank you very much. <laughs>